he got a level two kill. Um, I believe that was on to actually BRTT as well, onto Jinx. So they were able to open that one up and get a strong early advantage. However, it didn't really transcend into a big advantage later on because they were still even at CS the entire time. There were a lot of team fights in that game. It was yeah. very much a group situation. Arguably, I'd actually say JWoww didn't do enough with his lead, but the fact that he had a lead in the first place was pretty surprising given the match. Okay, well, other bands are coming in here for all sorts of world. We have Kasten taken away, Oriana taken away. For good reason, after we saw that last game, call me by pain. Yeah, and the fact about pain, most likely they would have left Oriana open because not only does Kami play an extremely good Oriana, Ocelot is not likely to want to pick that champion so much these days. Um, he has had a couple of unfortunate incidents in the past, so that's essentially a free ban use. And because they had first picked this game, they also have a free ban from Kasten. So you could argue in this situation, there's only one ban here for Oslo. Well, right now, at least it's going to be the last ban uh, picked up by them. And Payne immediately going to go for Gragas here for Kami in that middle lane. I want to say, I mean, obviously we saw RNA play him in the jungle earlier on today, but I think that's more of Kami's style right now. Gragas is the safest laner. He's going to stick. That will work basically no matter what you've got. It also fits in an awful lot of compositions. And right now, Ocelot World are most likely thinking, what are we going to do about Yasuo here? Are we going to pick it for ourselves? Are we going to try and run a mid lane against Gragas? Or are we going to let Payne get the Gragas Yasuo combo that has worked so well for so many teams so far? I don't think that's bad, concerned how long it's taken them to do any sort of picks here. but. Right now, they're hovering over Thresher, and that will get locked in. And Diu, he was a damn fine uh, Thresh player back in that spring split. Thresh is available, Annie available. Yeah, Thresh is a fairly safe pick here because obviously the other top tier support, it's this kind of triangle relationship, except one is banned out. Leona is an option for Pain. There is also the option, however, for stuff like Lulu, which can work really, really well against Thresh. And if they are building a tanky kind of initiator, as for uh, you know, for a jungler or for a uh, or for a top lane, that could be really, really solid to work with it. I haven't seen Pain actually pick it though, so it may not just be in their roster. But it still might. If they want to go for Yasuo top lane, that could be a very good. Gragas either way, but I'm not sure if Venom actually plays um, Yasuo yeah, much top lane, but we're going to see Olaf stand on against their team. Give him credit, he did pretty damn well uh, in the jungle. You know, for me, I always mention this whenever I've seen Olaf in the jungle, is uh, Nintendo Dex. He's the first guy in my history of knowledge of ever playing Olaf in the jungle, and he consistently played it even when people thought it was bad. But it has, come, it has risen back, uh, you know, to... to 13 did a, a damn fine job of it. Goes in circles. It's really Olaf. Yeah. Seems to vary, but at the moment he's kind of a respected top slash jungler, but not a highly sought after one. Mm -hmm. If you get that one guy that's really good at the champion, though, it's always worth doing. So, Oslo World, Thresh, Lucian, bot lane. There's nothing too special there, but Payne have once again picked Sona into that. And I have to say that's a scary proposition because, again, someone very, very squishy against a potential load of burst. Well, you can, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, we talked about that when we saw Sona pick the first time. We weren't really 100% convinced considering you're against an Annie who could just kind of burst you down, as well as Ezreal, who, in fact, did that uh, multiple times, pushed my lane quite a few times. But that late game presence on a Sona, I can't go underestimate it, as yeah. we saw in that game. It was ridiculous. It was able to open it up completely for them to win the game. But we do see Blanc. And Wukong. This, that's quite reminiscent of what we saw Millennium running earlier. They were doing it with Lee Sin, but if that's a jungle Wukong, which is it's most likely at this point in the kind of metagame at the moment, that could be a roaming gank squad post six. And that's a really, really scary proposition for Pain to deal with because they're picking a very team fight orientated team. Once again, they seem to like doing that. They get lots of AOE CC, throw it all in together and hope to come out on top in a five on five. But against that roaming gang squad, if they fall behind early, they get split up, they get picked off. That could start to work against them. One thing that Outside Worlds does have, though, at least, is that Morden, when we saw Ozone Giants back in the spring split, that was their thing. It was AoE team fights, control, CC, everything. And if any man knows how to do that, it's going to be him. He's going to know how to set this all up. But the synergy it takes to pull that off, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of time to really develop that. And right now, with Pain, with that disengage out of Gragas, it might not even work. What Ocelot World are going to do? <sighs> It is going to depend somewhat on their last pick here because 
as I mentioned before, Wukong could be either. Actually, Shivana could be either. But if they get that Shivana in the top lane, that's going to give them even more map pressure in the top. Most likely will be able to push back Surti for a long, long time. It takes Olaf a while to try and outscale. And if he falls behind even further from kills, that is an even worse situation. So you end up with a situation where you have the two-man potential roaming gang squad, Wukong and uh, I nearly called it Kerb, uh, <laughs> and LeBlanc moving together in the bottom jungle, getting picks. You get Shivana trying to roam down, and then you get pressure on the mid lane, allowing you to start taking towers and siege things in. All right, well, we do have a Mumu as the last pick for Pain Gaming here. It looks like he will be in the jungle. Sir T hit so many banish tosses when we saw him playing against Isaris. He really set up his team for a lot of kills in that first game. He did play in the second one, um, because I just didn't feel like playing it, but he's damn good in a Mumu. He's actually one of the few players I even see playing him anymore, but we're going to have Venom on Olaf top lane against the Shivana. I actually saw, by the way, yesterday, somebody in the Brazilian crowd holding up a, pa a, a piece of paper right before they played, uh, or sorry, after they played Isra's Gaming saying a Mumu Open. It was right. dominant in that game. Now they're going to be up against a slightly stronger dualist jungler. I mean, Payne was running it against a Zac before, who doesn't have that much invasion presence. If you are using Wukong against a Mumu, you kind of need to try and get stuff to work for you. But Wukong is arguably an equal late game team fight presence. Yeah, it depends on how they use it. I was wondering if they might pair it up with Yasuo on the top lane, kind of go for that, let's burst someone down quickly, let's end the fight right before it even begins. But they're going for that tanky top lane with Shimana. I'm not sure how much of a presence she'll be in these team fights, but in terms of lanes to watch, where do you expect all the action to really go down? Because we have that Gragas LeBlanc. We've seen that matchup just earlier on today. We have Shivana Ola top lane. We have that Lucian Thresh, Caitlyn Sona combo bottom. Where, where's your eyes going to be? Bottom lane is the most sensible place to watch. Thresh throws back the lantern, goes in, even if he misses the death sentence for Sona. Squishy character goes down easily. And of course, Caitlyn is going to try and push early on, try and get uh, you know that CS advantage. scary proposition to deal with, but it does mean Sir T can uh, fairly reliably go for counter ganks, and Amumu is actually very strong in a three-on-three -three situation, assuming it's a close-up fight. Very true, and I really want to see what's going to happen here. Pain, I mean, they're one map away from getting into the Grand Finals. Also, that's World, they're one map away from being dropped out and kicked out into the semis, and that's obviously not where they wanted to be when they flew all the way here basically last minute to replace Diddy Toss for us. But we're underway here, guys. It's going to be Pain Gaming on the blue side. We're going to have Onslaught's World on the red here. And level one, what do you expect? Level one Thresh Hook is a big, big factor. Pain don't the option of going for towards that bottom area. But Pain can fairly easily at least keep vision. The main ca uh, catch point is going to be around here. Wow, and BRTT reading it right here, actually walking towards him, spotting it, and then being forced to actually go just back it away. And we saw Essa do that actually with Seven Wars, and he kind of got caught out, and he was forced to flash and actually level up that rocket jump when he's playing Tristana. But both teams, they're gripping up towards the bottom side of this map here. It looks like all sorts world are going to be the ones to actually back away. Yeah, if you don't get someone and they know you're there, as a rule, not worth sticking around. They might catch you off guard. And even if they don't, they're not going to take an unfavorable trade. They can just counter-invade, steal your own jungle, and you won't necessarily know if they've done that. But actually looking to try and go for another invade there. Nothing really doing. They were trying for something right now. I mean, this is what I like to see out of a team when they lose the first map. is try something risky. Try to go for an invade. Try to make something happen early on. And they tried, but unfortunately, no one on Pain was there to really uh, be hit by that pull and by that hook. So we do have early work coming down in this bush here in the river. We are going to have Morden starting up at his red, as well as Surti starting up here at his blue. Looks like it'll be a very slow game in the beginning, but it can become very explosive. And I want to see Morden. You know, we saw him on Lee Sim. He wasn't doing that much counter jungling. He didn't pull up that many ganks. But if you're going to play a champion, like, this is exactly perfect for it. In the meantime, the bottom lane, we actually do see a hook on a Minerva there way inside that bush, and they're going to be trading here. And I have to say, Pain is come out as the victors of that one because you will have a sustain out of Sona that you just don't have out of Thresh. Yeah, and even and their health is higher as well, even before level 2 and Minerva's sustain. 
That gives Kaylin the opportunity to push out. That gives her that little edge early on, the experience advantage, and forces them back. That does mean Morden now has a bit of a reason to go for that bottom lane early on, but it would be a very, very predictable gank path if he chose to go for it. Oh, wow, you're actually seeing Dio back away off the bat. I'm not sure. Okay, let's say I wouldn't agree with that because then Hada would be screwed at that turret. Anyway, nice early advantage coming out of pain here. And BRTT getting a nice amount of CS. Not even once he has picked up for Hada with the flash. Okay. Coming out of BRTT might have been a little bit preemptive. Not really sure if I get that 100%, but that might just open up a game for Morden if he wants to visit after this blue buff. Yeah, the, the, even though it's a predictable gank path, if the guy has no flash, you will have a lantern to jump in. He'll, it, the timing would be about right for it to be level three if he goes for the white. Yeah, maybe, maybe. But at the same time, uh, he doesn't want to risk being counter gank. You can actually see Sir T is expecting the gank. He's ready for that situation. He's heading down. He's not going to be spotted working over here as well. And he said, hey, down deal. They're relatively healthy. More than actually not coming down right now. Sir T actually just going to back away either way since the lane is pushed up so far. So let's look at this top lane for a little bit. Venom. 15, 16 CS to the 7 of JWoww. Has a nice little bit of an early advantage. But more. I just want to, just want to check on Morty because he was already heading down. Yeah, now both the junglers are thinking about this bottom lane. But I've got to say, if Morton can get oh, all this... Oh, they're baiting it. Ooh, it's Pain risky. is baiting this in right now, and unfortunately that hook doesn't land. But they're still being so aggressive, they know Surti is there. They have Kami coming down from middle lane, and they're going to make this in perfectly. And Minerva is going to get slow. He's actually going to flash right there. comes Surti. He actually lands the hook. It goes straight for Hado. Here comes Kami from the side. They have the flashes. Will he go for it? He's going to go over the wall. He does flash. He does hit the Q every night, but there's not enough damage just yet. And they will be able to escape without losing anyone. But Kami there, smart roam, misjudged the range on the body slam flash. Down with their sacrificing some CS, sacrificing some levels in the mid lane. It might come back to bite him in the ass if Osaka can pull that one off in that 1v1. And right now, Venom doing a great job of really punishing JWoww here in this top side. Does have that CS lead, still does have that health lead as well. And both junglers. I want to say this at least. Sir Team, in the game versus Isris, on the first game that we saw him actually play in Moon Moon, he really camped out middle. He really wanted to get Kami fed, and he did in that game. This game, though, it's going to be harder, at least pre-6, to try and make anything happen. Amumu not going to have a lot of damage. Well, he'll have damage, but he won't be able to use it. Won't have a lot of CC early on. LeBlanc already very slippery. Post-6, though, with Kami, with Explosive Cask, with the double lockdown, they have the potential to go for ganks on the mid lane. But might be more worthwhile to try and snowball the bottom lane or the top, because it's rare to see JWoww falling behind early. It really is. I mean, he is probably one of the best top laners in Europe and is having a tough time at the moment. But I think one of the real key factors is that even though he's, you know, losing in terms of CS and he's, you know, getting harassed quite a bit, he hasn't left lane yet and he's staying alive. And it's, it, he's also preventing Venom from getting a bigger CS lead than he has. Not letting him get a bigger advantage. And right now, Morden is heading up towards his top side. He wants to make something happen. Maybe he's expecting Sir T to come in. JWoww going in for the fight here. Maybe trying to pull Sir T if he is there. Morning going to be able to get that stealth in, but he's forced to back away. And JWoww kind of just loses a lot of health for nothing right there. Yeah, now JWoww. More than half. It's the same. I don't feel JWoww is going to be happy with how that trade went. Yeah, he's definitely gonna be happy. And it looks like they're just gonna shove the lane here just so JWoww can back out. But those undertoes out of Venom, they are dangerous. He doesn't care. He's pushed up against two people of Ocelot's world, and he just is farming in front of him. He's just not really afraid, and you can see it's so healthy. JWoww getting dropped very low right there. Venom does have Ignite. He does have Ghost, and he is level 6, but JWoww finally hitting level 6 will have that ultimate to run away. And Morden was spotted heading back down towards middle from that ward in that tri bush, but he's not level 6 yet, and we're about six and a half minutes in. He needs to hit it soon because Sir T will be 6 momentarily. Yeah, neither of the junglers, though, are going to be able to get mid done before 6. Wukong needs that ultimate to cancel the Gragas body slam if he wants to get anything done. And right now, it's not too bad. Wukong will be able to farm the jungle pretty efficiently. He is a very solid jungler once he's gotten his first time.
pretty solid because the lane is pushed quite hard and Lot is starting to try and get the harass down with his own ultimate. Yeah, it's interesting to see, he's actually moving up a little bit different than Kerp was when we saw him. Kerp uh, maxed his Q and then maxed uh, W second. Also, it's actually maxing his W. I wonder if that's actually just to keep up with the wave clear um, that currently uh, Kami's able to do against him. Especially that blue buff is going to make it quite difficult, but either way, Ocelot is winning enormously in CIS currently. 55 to 35, has that nice 26 advantage, seven and a half minutes in. And he will have his group up in about a minute here to pick up. That is a slightly strange event, though. Falling behind to a LeBlanc early, who's only farming tool really is... Well, well, W now that she's maxed it. But even then, it's not going to compete with Gragas barrels and her auto attacks. And yet, in spite of that, she is just really zoning him badly. And, well, maybe that's just Ocelot showing us that he is a closet LeBlanc player, but... We also have to keep in mind, though, is that remember uh, when we saw that gank come down bottom by both junglers? Tommy actually rotated from middle down to bottom, so he missed out, a, actually, I think a level, like a, a straight level, and he was forced out a little bit right there. And also, has been doing, I think, a fantastic job of really using that to his advantage. A hook, unfortunately, not going to land more. coming in. He is level 6. We do get the fight. Minerva could be in trouble. He already does have the red buff. There is the ultimate. Minerva's going to be knocked up. We're going to see First Blood come in here for someone, I would imagine, as Hayda doesn't want to pick it up. But now he's being forced with the Kaelin Ultimate to back away. First Blood going over to also its world. Hayda picking that one up with a fantastic game coming in by Morden. But look at the actual gold difference. It's only 300, and it only just ticked over to that. It's not as big as it should be, considering how long it took to get that first blood. And now Surti going head to head against Morden here. Morden running away since he has VRTT heading up towards him as well. He wants to go to watch out this blue buff. He wants to give it over to Ocelot, but Payne responding in a fantastic fashion, trying to keep it off of that LeBlanc, because if you do that, you're not going to do too well as the game goes off. You can see the damage already done. Kami knocked down about half health. Surti does have some available. Morden has as well. Morden actually doesn't get it. Surti uh, is the one able to pick it up, and they do deny that blue buff away from Ocelot. Yeah, that's a nice pickup once again. Now, will Ocelot actually be able to stay in lane at the moment? There is no explosive cast from Kami, so he doesn't have to be worried about that. But a body slam flash into a Q or a would flash be enough. Ultimate. You're, you're, you're dead. You're gonna die right there. Careful, he needs to make sure. Kami, a way to get back in this game in terms of CS and the catch back up. He's got the flask and he's got the biscuit as well. So he's gonna sustain himself back up now and he is building that HP pool back up. But but, Gragas is free to rotate. Gragas is free to go back. Whichever one he chooses to do, actually just going to take a rage count. Yeah, he's going to keep farming up quite a bit here. Let's look at the total goal between the two mid laners. He's actually down about 300 at the moment. He has a nice 1200 to spend here. And right now, Tansla is shoving that middle lane down. It looks like he actually wants to go by or maybe roam around here and really force some pressure on Akami. In the meantime, though, Sir T. Heading down towards the bottom side of the map, he's looking for a gank and he hasn't used his ultimate just yet. But they have that crescendo combo if they want to go for it. They're trying to bait Ocelot a little bit far out, or Ocelot's world a little bit far out here. And more, it's heading down from the top side. He actually has ultimate available as well. We could see major fight break out, but just saw Surti back away. This is once again Surti playing a counter ganking game. He was ready for Wukong to potentially go back down. He was actually just on my arriving. Happy for the lane. You notice there's a gaping CS gap, even with the gold from the kill. Kaelin's ahead, and that all stems from that level one action we saw too. Uh, you know, we saw VRTT and Minerva go head to head against uh, Dude and Haydel, and they came out the victors in that little bit of a skirmish before the minions even spawned. And it seems to be. A little bit of a snowball effect. We know Caitlyn, she does fall off mid-game, and that's where Lucian really shines. And he is going for that Bloodthirst. He's going to have quite a bit of damage here. I'm pretty sure he can out-trade Hado at the moment, who only has that face. Caitlyn puts you in, essentially, the Caitlyn trap. You get shoved up against the tower, you get poked under the tower, and your minions are dying to the tower, so you get less lifesteal. That means as long as you don't get any kind of relief, any kind of jungler presence, you end up going further and further behind on CS as time goes by, and bot lane has remained relatively unscathed, other than that one gank from Morden. Certainly, he's looking for a gank here in middle. He's off to the side, but also that he's not biting it. He's not going to attack that hook. He's going to wait back. 
Jaywell and Venon still going to head to head towards the top side. And Venon, you know, Spectre's Cow going to have that extra regen off of it. Morden heading down towards bottom lane. As well as Sir T, we might see that fight break out. Bo Chung is really focusing on this bottom lane at the moment. But not a lot of successful games have really stemmed from it. Sir T is hacking around still. Waiting for Morden to do something in this bot lane, but thus far he's not had a lot of luck. There is still a Lance and Gank available, the Cyclone is available, the Flashes are available, and Surti is there and ready and waiting. Right now, I think, I think Outsouts World knows something's up. They think they know that Surti is here because Pain is pushing very, very heavily. And Morden's gotta be careful. He moves outside that bush towards the left side. He will be spotted by that ward. And Dude, trying to put that pressure for that potential hook. Here it comes. Fortune not gonna land on anyone. And I would imagine that means Morden's gonna back away and he's gonna take that white can. But for all this time that Morden is spending, he's not getting a lot from it. And meanwhile, Oslo's world are bleeding gold in this top lane because JWoww the difference is increasing as time goes by. It is and way and that is Ben and that free rate over this turret. That one's gonna fall. We're gonna see the first turn of the game go over to Pain. And they're gonna solidify their lead here, even though they are down that first plus. Pain? Continuing to take advantages here, and Ocelot will need to do something about it. But unlike normally when top tower falls because of a jungler gank and because of a two-man commitment, there isn't really an easy dragon for them to go for. So again, Morden's only real option is to gank Olaf if he overcommits really heavily in top lane, or to try and go for the bot gank, which Surti has done so much time and spent so much of his effort on just cancelling out. Because right now he doesn't know where Morden is, so he's thinking, well, it might well be the case that he's a bot. I really like this ward that Ocelot put down right here. It spots Surti coming in from that raid side. Also makes it so he can't actually lose that ward if there was a pink ward in this uh, this bush right here. But right now, Pain, going to run through that pink ward. Looks like they're going to start grouping up for Dragon here because they have that top turret down. They can afford to leave Venom down towards uh, towards it. And Jaywa, well, he's not in a position to really stop it right now. It looks like Ocelot's world is going to have to get this up. Yeah, and they're not even going to get top tower for him because that hasn't been taking any damage. Venom gets to leave a little bit early because there's no contest. So they will be able to save their tower. They get the dragon, getting quite a significant gold lead now. And I'm interested to see what their next move is. It feels like the next logical... He is now starting to get a decent number of levels and a decent bit of item advantage. So he may just look to get the, f the gang action done. It's been a relatively quiet game. I don't know how you feel about Spineton, but compared to last, not a lot of action happening. I mean, one kill, 14 minutes in. I think we had about 27 kills, 25 minutes or something like that last game. So it's a lot slower. And I guess both teams realizing that pain, hey, we're one map away from getting to the grand finals. And also that's world realizing that, hey, we're one map away from losing, from getting kicked out in the semifinals. So both teams take this very seriously, trying to pick up the win they need here. Hesitation can destroy you, though. Ocelot's world have not been making many proactive moves. And you can see more of them has been scared to go for those ganks in the Right. Advantage over Sir T, who's been spending a lot of time in that bottom lane as well, just looking for that defense. And Ocelot potentially could have been killed there, by the way, if explosive cards had been thrown after that. Exactly, could have right there. And one thing you have to keep in mind is actually Ocelot's going a little bit different than we saw Kurt build. He's actually going for that, uh, I was about to say he's going for that Newton Holy Grail, but maybe just keep that chalice for that regen in lane, because he does have the items he needs for that DFG. And Sir T is pushed all the way through the jungle. He hasn't been spotted just yet. They might try to go for gank on Haydel here. It's going to be very dangerous. He's still waiting inside that tri-bush. Haydel actually just running away, and Sir T notes, and there's no words in there. <laughs> uh, won't get anything off either way, but we do have an orb picked up. We have that greater orb picked up on a BRTT, and we've only seen that one time today. Or sorry, one time throughout this entire tournament, and that was yesterday. It's an interesting thing about it on Caitlyn specifically, though, because sometimes it's worth it for her in order to make sure she can use her auto attack range if someone is hiding in a brush. With other characters, it's not so much use. 
Shavar actually now potentially is about to get some reinforcements. Ocelot's world are pretty much surrounding Olaf, who's running away and trying to recall, but oh, he does, he does not have time. He does have right arm, he does have Ghost though. They're not gonna get the knock up, it's actually just waits on it. Ghost is popped, looks like he should be able to run away here, and he will escape. Okay, I'm a little bit surprised there, but no lockdown available, I guess, because of the ultimate. So, yep. Ocelot's well commit three people, get nothing, and Pain now have a chance to maybe try and cut them off. Sir T is, is brave, moving towards them all, but he's actually supported by his team now, so it wouldn't be so bad if he engaged. And also getting hit by that bear right there, and, you know, BRTT yesterday on that Draven, he, he is the only AD carry I've ever seen to pick up that greater orb, and he seems to like it and uh, use it very well, but right now, neither of these teams want to go for a team fight. They're really hesitant, they're not feeling like they have an advantage either way, and I'm not sure Payne realizes they have that 2,000 gold lead, but it's not really reflecting the items just yet. I mean, yeah, you have BRTT with that Bloodthirster. You have that Holy Grail done for uh, Kami Middle, but that's just about it. No other major... ...though, with Lucian still not having the means to get on her and get aggressive, does mean that she can continue to apply pressure to that bot lane if she chooses to do so. With the Sona with her as well, they can just continue to play this slow push across the board and then rotate for the, for the mid lane, which Kami is keeping pushed up very effectively. Yes, he is, and he's starting to slowly catch up to Ocelot in terms of CS here. Ocelot's been doing a fantastic job of really trying to farm away. And still, 18 minutes in, only one kill. And every time I see a game like this, I think to myself, this is the type of game and that's going to explode. It's going to take, whether it's in 5 minutes, 20 minutes, the explosion comes, the, the ending is not too far behind, it's going to be constant action left and right like we saw in the game prior. ...that it can get really uh, sudden advantages for one team or the other because of one of the changes in season four which is now you can get a cs streak effectively the gold value of killing you goes up from farming if everyone's doing nothing but farming suddenly one team fight that goes heavily in one direction or the other can be a swing of like five thousand gold that's a lot Surprise that. I, actually, I wish I had Kurt to talk to you about this. A little block. How effective is she if she doesn't get any kills versus the CS that she's picking up? Like right now, Oslo's been doing a fantastic job with CS. He makes sure he keeps his items coming in. He has a DFG done. But he also doesn't have the burst potential yet that you want to see out of a block. I mean, obviously, he's level 12. It's still relatively around the game. And maybe that will change in a few, uh, few minutes. She's not quite as mess as uh, snowball dependent as she used to be nowadays. The way she tends to work is that late game she gets to get her ultimate on a very short cooldown. She bursts someone either out of the fight completely or very very low, and then backs off and then waits for the you know 15, 16, 17 seconds to get a second rotation off and burst someone else either completely out of the fight or finish someone off. So it's. Uh, it, it, she's not as dependent, as I say, on uh, snowballing as she used to be, but she can still snowball very, very hard. And Payne, they are starting to group up a little bit here. Dragon comes in about 20 seconds. They're still leaving Venom on top lane to start pushing as he does make his way down here. Remember, last time Dragon was available, J.O. wasn't down in time, and it was just a free Dragon to Payne, and they're going to be there exactly as it comes up. And it doesn't look like Ocelot's world's going to even try to contest it here, but we will have Ocelot picking up his own blue. He doesn't have a lot of mana to spend at the moment. The words down, Payne should be able to take this. But are they going to lose the mid tower? Shivana is there. Now the rest of the team is there. Ben and he's a smart man. Actually trying to take that pink uh, ward away, or to that take that ward away. So he gets hit with pretty much everything. Boss, even the DH doesn't really do too much damage to him, but it does force the Ragnarok, which opens up the potential ultimate out of Boran to knock the entire team up. But there is a crescendo. There's an Amuma ultimate. There's a Grog's to knock them away. And right now, BRTC is down at the bottom lane. And also, so instead of pushing middle, they're just going to go back to farming their lanes. And Ocelot himself, his ultimate is now nearly back up again. That's the point I mentioned before. He can get multiple rotations off 
and that is why he's so, so valuable. But he's not doing enough damage to someone like Olaf at this stage of the game to really make that worthwhile. So, as a result, BRTT, his being in bottom lane wasn't punished because Venom wasn't forced away, creating a 3v5 in the mid. All right, now, Ocelot World. They're, they're, not far, they're not behind that much gold. Like, for instance, the, the, the depth that they have hasn't been growing too much. And yeah, there has been a dragon here there that has really opened things up a little bit, but they're not falling too far behind, and right now we're seeing Morden. He's out towards the top side. He's looking for a gank on a Venom. Venom doesn't even have his ultimate up. Right? Just over halfway done. But Ocelot's here as one. Well. It looks like we might see Ocelot's World pick up the first turn of the game, and they do want to go for it. In fact, they're actually going to do that. Surtees off to the side. He's going to push away Ocelot. But the turret, it still stands. It does still stand, and still no team fights either, but Ocelot are also pushing down in the bottom lane. Hadel will be there. This should drop from this, but they've done no damage to it during the laning phase. Kaelin can't really stop them two on two on one, though. Now, let me paint. I want to say, it looks like they get the here since their AD care support is down bottom lane. Their TT will be joined the rest of the down uh, from the top side. And we will have that five minute push on the middle, but we do. This world pick up that turn in the bottom lane. They do even almost give things up one to two, but it's will be three to one now in favor of pain. They do get a little bit of extra gold off of this, but still the game very slow here on both these teams. And it's a little bit surprising to me that it's this slow at the moment, but at the same time, it still makes sense. They're just playing a very farm focused game, but I feel like that's going to favor Pain in the long run. It's gonna take a long, long time, obviously, for Caitlyn to outscale Lucian. But otherwise, I'd say every single character on both teams is not equivalent in role, but equivalent in terms of their late game scaling. So Caitlyn will be better than Lucian in the super, super late game, and arguably maybe Sona will be better than Thresh. But Shivana is probably going to be a, a serious threat late game, and Wukong much the same as a Mumu. So it's just going to continue until one side can find the situation to take advantage of. But because they're so scared, they're also not really getting much warning. Well, we're about 23 minutes in. Let's go ahead and take a look at the items that we have built up between both these teams. Venom has a little war warmogs. You know, why not? It's at 3,100 life right now, 23 minutes in. You know, it's that build water cutlass uh, plus that spectral's count. We see the locket coming in momentarily for Surti. We see the death cap almost done for Kami right now, and that bloodthirster static ship picked up for BRTT. Bloodthirster static ship. Image now. Three items. Break point where she starts to scale up woods again because that's kind of where AD carry items really come to the fore, and that's all Caitlyn is. She's just a long-range user of AD carry items in the late game. As things are right now, it's going to continue at this current growing rate. JWoww is going to farm the jungle by the looks of it. That's a... No one's in top lane. I'm a little bit surprised to see that because in this situation where everyone's just playing farm build and like competing in that, in an entire lane undefended when there's no real objectives to force is a little bit remiss. I feel like watching Farmville might be more fun than what's happening right now because this is probably one of the most boring games I've ever casted so far. It's just no one's doing anything. They're just more happy about farming away than really fighting and that's really not going to work just yet. You need to make some fight happen. You need to make something happen between the teams. Something's got to give. And you know it's going to kick off. I mean, with what's at stake, $15,000 uh, for first place. You know, one team is going to crack, or one team's going to get that engage that they're finally looking for and get them out of place, and we're going to have this thing break wide open. But 2.4 thousand gold is the difference between these two teams. And like I said before, it really hasn't changed. We just see Crescendo. Ocelot fades up the Crescendo. So damn well done right there. And that might have opened up the engage that Ocelot's world will finally created some level of this disparity. That's a major ultimate down for pain. But because Ocelot's not going to be also what will he's not going to be in position to go for a team fight paid a back away and the crescendo is going to be back up by the time dragon is so actually it may not have created that much of an advantage well, let's see what happens here in just a few seconds it looks like the entirety of Ocelot's world is going to be back in a lane but i mean 
meantime, so is Pain. And I think you're right. I think we're gonna see the dragon be Shouldn't it will be available for that. So worked out for him in that last game, saving BRTT and pretty much giving them the victory in uh, map number one. We do see the brutalizer picked up for Morden, as well as those Merc treads. And we have, you know, JWoww, who was kind of hurting in terms of farm. He's caught back up. He's he's doing pretty well. He hasn't fallen farther behind, which is really key. He does have that Sunfire Cape. He does have almost that well, Black Cleaver, if he wants to go for it, done. He has the Bulldog Cutlass. And this so now we have some actual gameplay going on. Now comes the vision for the Ogre Dragon. Pain are going to try and rush it down again, but everyone from Oslo World are actually in position to look to test this. And this fight, as I mentioned, all accumulating from up, it's very important. Oslo, like he's around the back, he's looking for Gage. We just see Venom actually uh, fought off right there. He's pushed out right away. Minerva being the one focused down here is Oslo. Does go back, Dragon does go in the way of pain here. Venom very low on life. Also, unfortunately, not gonna land the ultimate. Adam Remo finally coming in here. The Morden ultimate knocks him up, but right now we see also pick up the first kill. Oslo World is chasing down pain here. They finally pick up another one. Beer see very low on life, but he almost turns around back up into J Wow. Also, is he done just yet? He's looking for some sort of engage over that wall. He will hop it, but this might allow Oslo World to finally push down middle. They lost the dragon, but they're gonna get the two kills and maybe even a tower. Yeah, JWoww is going to have to back out, but there's not going to be any way that Pain can actually safely get to the mid lane tower to defend it. Ocelot's there, he's got his ultimate back up again. So, free, uh, not a free tower, a tower for a dragon. A little bit more map control for Ocelot's team, which could work out for them. They do have that potential for a two-man roaming gank squad. Although I've got to say, they have, Morden and Ocelot have not been working in the same way uh, that Kerb and Co. were doing earlier, but even so, Disparity creates gameplay. Well, I wish Disparity created more in or more fun gameplay to watch because this is still not really too entertaining to watch as a viewer at home. 28 minutes in here, three to zero. We still have that gold lead in favor of Pain here. And since we're about you know 30 minutes in, let's talk about you know these team fights as you break into it. You know what are each team looking for when these team fights break out? You know what's the engage? What's the disengage? You know, who's trying to burst down who? Who's the one going to dive to the backside? What are we looking at? Basic plan for Ocelot himself is to try and burst someone low, then go back in. Basic plan for Ocelot's team as a whole is to wait for that opportunity when someone's been taken a little bit low, and then try and get Shivana and Wukong on the back line. Hadel can obviously then try and grind through Sir T and Venon, and Thresh will do a lot of work in keeping them off. But they've got to be very, very careful because the flip side plan certainly is very, very similar. It's just a little bit more burst that can be thrown very easily onto the back line. A lot of this is going to depend on the opportunities Ocelot create because and Kami all throwing everything they've got at the back line, that would kill Hadel instantly. BRTT, much harder to reach his longer range, and there's not as much burst damage when you come out of Ocelot. Steve. Oh, also, is 1-0-1, one one, so he does maybe have some sort of snowball going on, and we saw, you know, Kurt use it in the, uh, the game with Millennium, at how damn well hard he can snowball once he gets those first couple of kills, and also that's where it looks like they're gonna start pushing up just a little bit here. They have a couple of wards coming down into the river, nothing really too aggressive just yet. There is one ward here to spot anyone backing up that middle lane, but both teams still very hesitant to fight in pain. They got the dragon, they lost the two kill or the two deaths. They're in the turret. But that was also due to Venom just being so far out of position. Yeah. It looks like we got some hate going head to head against BRT. The ultimate gonna come in. Is he gonna be up? Yes, he gets the kill! And that is one kill going over to BRTT finally after such a long time. Pain pick up the first kill after about 30 minutes here. And it looks like Gonna start grouping up and start pushing down middle. Yeah, they have the opportunity now to go for the push. BRT is gonna join up with them so they can start to siege the tower. Ocelot needs to try and use this opportunity this time now to poke someone low if he can. Otherwise, they're just gonna have to contend with Kaylin auto attacking and try maybe to sneak and engage on her using Wukong. 
And so Tricky also has to be so careful because Beacon, if he overextends, gets engaged upon, and gets locked down, he's gonna die. They're gonna lose more than just one turret here. Hado will be responding here in a couple seconds. Paint picking up their fourth turret of the game, maintain that lead right there. And they maintain a 3.2 thousand gold lead as well. So, gonna be going back to playing a little bit of Farmville once again. At this point, Baron rushes are starting to become a factor because both of the teams are getting very, very far and very, very strong and have decent Baron clears between the two of them. Ocelot World currently has the control over that area and are moving towards it as well. I feel like Pain are alert to the possibility, but then again, World and just sneak it using the fact that they, can, they don't need... Ocelot can run interference if, and stop Pain from trying to contest it and use Hadel, use Wukong, and uh, use JWoww to try and stop the oh, Baron going uh, here to we go. Down. Remember what happened last time Ocelot World came in from this top side against Pain. They're trying to bait them in here. This could be very dangerous seeing Pain. They're starting to group up. They're come around the side here. Will Ocelot's World spot them coming in? They did, I believe, see them in the hands of JWoww while the rest of the team, the AD carry support, pushed down this middle lane. And Unfortunately, they're not going to get the engage they wanted to. We had a little bit of an exchange between JWA and Venom there. But not enough to really write home about. Pommy getting very low. If he gets locked down, this could be Enema. The barrel comes out, but they get the kill. No, Cersei only locks down Morden. He's in a fall, but who really cares in the end of things as JWA jumping in towards the backside? Hey, now is not being touched in this entire fight. Crescendo is no longer available. JWA gets hit with the badge. He goes down. Double could have been TT. They're chasing it awesome. Well, can't have the ultimate available. They do have it, but he's going to use it. Will he get the kill? No, but Venema, he steals it away. And Pain coming out with those three kills after Kami getting engaged upon by Kami's last dying wish was to barrel them into the team of Pain and to separate them, giving them those three kills. And Ocelot was so determined to finally create an opportunity for his team to engage, he actually ended up hamstringing them. That's going to cost them a lot of map control, a lot of objective control. Pain pushing in, going to take the inhib, potentially going to then back out and look to set themselves up for the next barrel. Oh, oh my god, look at that one attack out of BRTT. Hey, that might... Whew. He might be in trouble if he was to stay a little bit too long right there. But everyone is now back alive for pain. We're seeing pings on Baron. We're seeing pings on Dragon. You can hear the crowd and how excited they are. We have a lot of money to spend across the board for them as well. And this is getting to that breaky point where pain, with that middle inhibitor being down, this opens up so many possibilities for him that also for what has to force something here soon. They're falling behind once again. They've lost the inhib now. So Arguably now the, the onus is on pain to make something happen with the pressure they've got and not just let Ocelot well farm bill until the inhib comes back up. Baron is an option, bottom lane is an option. A split push style might work for them and they can certainly get vision control over the Baron area so long as they make sure to group up first, play it safe and face check only using Olaf and Amun. Well, right now we're 33 and a half minutes and we should take stock of things. It's currently 4-4 four four between both these teams. 51.3 thousand goals to the 49, or 45.9. Pain completely winning in that sense as well as those 5 turns to 3. They have that one inhibitor down. They have 3 of their 4 kills on BRTC at the moment. And he is so powerful. So hard he can hit. He shot. And Half-Life and even Sir T is not afraid there. Go for that little bit of gauge. Has that locket done? Building up towards a Randuins, I want to imagine, with uh, those two cloth or er, cloth armors. Not such world. They're pushing down middle. They're having pain out of position. Yeah, indeed. Now Venom's actually potentially going to take a lot of damage, but he's so so tanky. But the collapse is coming down. And Jay, wow, he's trying to distract him. He's going to be away as he has the ultimate available. We do see Morden come over that wall towards Blue Buff here, and Kami will he try to steal it away with that ultimate? We're going to see Ocelot actually steal it away, so they're going to deny it away from them. They do have a little bit of control back of this game. They are forcing the fights towards the middle of the map, just on Payne's side. They're shoving down that middle lane. And Payne, they need to make some sort of answer. They need to make some sort of engage, and it might come in the hands of a nervous crescendo when he does have that flash available. Letting the blue buff go, they're not a major concern for Payne. They're not actually playing the defensive game right now. It does decrease their sieging potential a little bit. The next move for Pain, though, really, is to force a fight. They have a very fair AD carry. And I have to wonder why thus far they've just been kind of sitting around and not really doing much with the Super Freaks. It's very true, and 
I think it's just not wanting to blow this lead that they've been able to build up. I mean, I, I'm thinking back to the Copenhagen Wells spring split of uh, LCS and how they could win early on. They could dominate a game very early in the beginning, but they didn't know how to close it out. They were too afraid to go for engages that they should be able to win. They didn't really know their limits, and right now Pain seem to be having a similar problem. They have a giant advantage. But we also saw Os or Oslo's world have advantage of that last second with that uh, last engage that came out. Yeah. Might be the heat's affecting everybody. Yeah. It's, it's affecting me right now. No, I it's really sweating. affecting might get caught out just a little bit here. As I throw something to get away. We need to see Payne, maybe 205 armor. He's not able to do that much damage on him. Also, it's going to be sitting in this bush here with the help of more. They might be able to get the engage on the backside that they want. We see the hook land on Venom. That's what the target they wanted to make happen. They turn around. Also, gets locked down. He doesn't hit the shot. He gets knocked away. The ace oh. the hole. And picks him up here since he gets the kill. And that shuts down the major break potential out of Ultimate World. And Morden being forced to back out of this. And this might be a turret going down. Certainty committed that ultimate just to get the kill on Ocelot. And it worked out. And now that they've gotten rid of Ocelot. Siege. Oh my god, it's close to the lantern, Cole, it's Jay Wow, middle with that inhibitor is naked right now. They should be able to get this. There's very little potential for Ocelot World to engage this fight at a disadvantage. So that goes down. Now they can back out. If they want to, they can continue to siege though. They're not low on they're not low on health. They still have all the options in the world. They really do. And it looks like that option is going to come down to Baron here. They have those two sweeper lenses. They have that greater orb as well. They're going to hop over that wall. Remember, Morden, he is available. He has his flash. He has a smite. He has the stealth potential to come in as well. Oh, so there is a pink ward down. Let's take a look at that Baron health down. It's about half up and now, down to about 5,000. It's going to be taken out very quickly. JWoww's going to hop in there to give him that vision. Let's see if Payne's going to try to take this down very fast. JWoww just distracted him. They said, forget the Baron. Let's hit JWoww. And the Baron down about 1,500 health. They pushed him out. Or it's not going to go in. Also, how to the wall to see him. They get the Baron buff, and they're going to try to chase after also that's one. Morden, he is actually, hey, no, sorry, he might be in trouble. The Ace and going to come in. Oh, let's get the kill. to force the flash. And also to run force to just completely back away from pain. Full health, almost full mana. They have a Ruiz ultimate up. They have the Crescendo in just a second. They have the flash out of Sona. And this could be the end of the game coming here in just a few seconds. Pain haven't backed in a long, long time. They're going to do that next. And then they're going to go and, well, siege bottom lane almost certainly. That is the best option for them right now. They can pick up their final item to pick up, for instance, a Last Whisper on BRTT and then they can siege. But the problem is they're going to face up against Ocelot again, and unless they can catch him in the same way they did before, Kaelin is never going to dare go near the tower for fear of that instant combo. I feel, though, that at this point, pain are just completely taking control of the game, and it's just Ocelot playing a very slow, defensive style. All right now, we're 30 and a half minutes in. The heat is kicking in. Payne, they can taste the victory right now. They are so close to finishing this off and advancing into the Grand Finals. The first Brazilian team to ever do it here until Extreme Master Sao Paulo. They're going to start pushing this bottom lane. They don't have Sona. They don't have Caitlyn. They need to be careful because Ocelot well, he doesn't really have the damage to burst any of those two down, but he might be able to get Kami very low off of this. And here comes the Siege. Mid lane, Hasselfriens pushing down in favor of Pain. All it really takes is that one hook and that burst potential coming out. But also, he does have Blue Buff. He's low on mana right now. He's using all of it just to wave clear currently, and that's going to roam out very soon. They're going to have to get this turn uh, up in just a second. Hasselfriens does have those home guard boosts, though, to reach you on the fight here. It's only a matter of time before Pain get this turn. It's always the engage if Shivana and Wukong get on ARTT, he's gonna die. Power, but the in him tower won't drop so easily. And the mid in him, it's not gonna respawn for a little while yet. But you have to wonder how long the siege is gonna go on for. 
as long as Payne wants, as long as they can. Look at that turret dropping very fast. BRTT is destroying it. Also, are they going to go for the game trip? Oh, no! Also, get knocked out the back, but the Omo Ultra Adam Remember doesn't really launch out anyone. They're going to lose the turret, but how they lost the war, they can still go over this right now as everyone's going to heal it up with those home guard players. The second hit there does well, and Payne, they are going to back out. Continued objectives gained. Pain of just getting the fight. And Arcelot will do not dare fight back. So as long as this situation continues, it's just going to be the slow bleed out for Arcelot. They need to do something. They do, and they're going to keep searching here. He's all by himself. He's going to get caught here. He's going to get locked down. The hook not going to land. The ace will come in and hits Dude in the face. And that has forced them up. Arcelot gets stuck they on a trap. Get him. And they could not get the kill. They committed quite a bit to that. And that is paid with a great escape. That's what they needed. They needed to get a pick. That one thing that their composition does better than Pains in the late game is picks. And they just aren't finding the opportunities. Now they're in a situation where Payne are going to go the top lane or possibly mid lane when that respawns. They have all the gold advantages. They have a good sieging AD carry who's soon going to be able to build a Banshee's Veil, making it much safer to siege towers. And Ocelot are going to be forced into a situation where they engage or they lose the final few objectives and then they just lose. Well, right now, Ocelot, he has that Void Sub done. He has Death Cap done. He has that DFG done. He could possibly kill Kami or BRTT or even Minerva if he could get into that back line. But we saw in that last fight alone how damn hard and deadly it can be if you do try to go back there. He was knocked into his own team. Luckily, he was able to trade places with that W and stay alive. But who knows what would happen if he did get taken down. That might have been the end of the game. And right now, Payne, they're shoving up middle. They're pushing this lane in. They might start to, uh, start to move top lane to push that one in and go for the last inhibitor. Minerva dodging out on that hook. This inhib will fall if Payne are allowed their way. BLTT did just lose his Banshees, which is a very critical fact. And it gives Ocelot and then last jump. There it is, he's going in for it. He does back up. Crescendo just laid on Ocelot. They're going to pile on top of him. He goes down. The Moomoo ulti blocking down Hayden. That's one of their traces straight for the ADK. That in very low life, he's forced to back away. And Ocelot's rolled enough touch just yet. They have so many people low. BLTT's not being touched. Now he is unstoppable. Picking up another kill. Payne out. He's trying to run for his life. j saving his life. It doesn't matter. Kali gets a kill. And that is three men now down. They have the super minutes. They have two next turns to take down. They are so goes to lock this one away. Ocelot's desperation to kill BRTT hasn't cost him the game. It was the lonely thing he could do, but it didn't work. And unfortunately for him, he did go down. BRTT is just attacking away at those turrets. He's not taking basically any damage. They're looking for this last bit of fight. One next turret falls. The second one is going to fall here. Payne Gaming are going to upset Ocelot's world, taking this 2-0 and advancing into this grand final to play against Millennium. And that crowd, a standing ovation for their home team, getting into the Grand Finals, being the first team ever to get there with fantastic play out of every single member by Payne. It wasn't a pretty win. It wasn't a smooth win, but it was a win nonetheless. And that's all that matters here. And Ocelot Worlds are going to be disappointed with that result. They came into this maybe arrogantly thinking, we are EU, we are one of the best regions. Maybe we can just... this far in the tournament, the crowd still on their feet. Viva Brazil is all I can really say right now because they will be going up against Millennium. And if they play anything like they did just now, we could have pain. We could have our first Brazilian champion here at Intel Extreme Masters Sao Paulo. They would love that to a degree. I don't think anything has ever been loved before by a crowd. That would be just an amazing result for them. And Millennium, they've been having some problems earlier today. They were having games where they were thinking, well, how are they almost losing to Seven Wars? How are we not able to close out these games? There are weaknesses. They are not indestructible. They didn't really have the clean wins that they were expecting in that game, but paid. I mean, I want to say this for them. The mental fortitude to just sit there 43 minutes in, basically, with a total of maybe five kills after the first half an hour, to just sit there, stay calm, stay focused, and to keep that goal in their minds. And guys, let's keep pushing this. We're one map away from closing this one out. We're one map away from getting there. And they did that. I mean, we had BRTT finish 5-0 and 1. He was full built with Infinity Edge, Bloodthirster, Banshee's Veil, Static Shift, Last Whisper, 366 CS. We had Ben in top lane just completely controlling it. Congratulations to them. There's nothing else to say. Respect to them. They've done a really good job.